Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the start of another wonderful week. Today, we are just going to be discussing the two films on our first topic, Inception and The Matrix, and what the, the topic is. Really, I'm just going to draw some attention today to some of the scenes in the, the film, uh, each of the films, a few interesting lines, a few interesting things to think about. By no means take what I say here in, in this video or in any of the other videos where I'm explicitly discussing the films as exhausting the film content, as being the only interesting things to talk about in the films, as being things that I definitely want you to talk about if you're writing on them. I, I think you probably won't go wrong if you decide to focus on some of these, these scenes and issues. But even in my own notes on, on the films, and from watching them, uh, I know that there's, there's more to be said, but I want to try to keep these videos, when I'm talking about the films, uh, relatively succinct. I already fear I'm going to run on for ages and ages, so I, I'm trying to limit myself on what I say. I'm also trying to leave some room for uh, you to explore and, and find more things to talk about, find uh, more interesting places where, you know, I, I want to leave you a sense of, uh, there's more to it. Carl hasn't sort of beaten this thing, um, you know, for, you know, gone on for so long. At this point, we're just beating a dead horse and there's really nothing more to say. Now, I've, um, I've watched both of these movies a number of times and I, I, I don't quite want to say I've, I've noticed every interesting thing in the films because I think that's, probably thinking too much of myself and too little of, of the directors and the writers and people who work a very long time in bringing a film like this together. But I certainly think I've seen a lot of things. So uh, just jumping over and, and taking a look at our two films here and, and really what our topics are, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about as well you know, my own watching of these. So our first topic is global skepticism. And, and really, what, what do I mean there? Well, skepticism you're probably familiar with, being uncertain about something, not being sure we know something. That's, that's really an easy way to think about skepticism. Somebody's skeptical about something in particular, right? Um, they, they aren't sure if something is true or, or if there's real knowledge about something. So we might call somebody, say, a climate skeptic, and they might be uncertain about whether or not climate change is real, right? They'd be asking history, well, how do we know that's real? Or, or how do we know what the causes of it are? That would be, you know, a, a genuine skeptic. Um, somebody skeptical about something, often we take that to mean that they believe something is false. So we might also use the phrase climate skeptic to describe somebody who thinks that it's not real. But if we're, we're trying to be strict with our use of terms, really what we should be saying there is that somebody who's a climate skeptic that term really only properly applies to somebody who really just isn't certain, right? They just, they don't know. They don't claim to know, or they might think that other people don't know whether or not the, the climate is changing. So a skeptic is somebody who claims to not have knowledge about something in particular, some area. Now, when we're talking about global skepticism, the way I'm talking about it here, what are we talking about? Really talking about claims to knowledge much more generally. So um, this, this comes out in, the, the films really with these sub questions, you know, are we in a dream or are we in a computer simulation? Another way of phrasing this, this issue, uh, which is, is very general, is like this. Is reality the way it appears to us? We all have sensory experience, right? We, we go around the world, we um, see things and touch things and smell things and hear things. And that sensory experience we have, or at least a lot of it, Maybe, perhaps not all of it, we take to be really the starting points for much, if not most, if not all of our knowledge. And philosophers over the, the years have debated this, um, you know, to what extent does our knowledge come from sense experience? To what extent can we have knowledge that goes beyond sense experience or is completely independent of sensory experience? We're not really going to be getting into those issues, but rather what we're going to be focusing on in this unit is really this question about how can we be sure, or how can we know that we, in fact, are not in a dream or in a computer simulation? How can we know that the world is the way it appears to us? And this is precisely the sort of issue that um, when we're thinking about you know, what philosophy is, 
well, it's, it's trying to figure out the truth of controversial matters. Uh, it doesn't seem on the surface particularly controversial that the world is the way it appears to us most of the time. Now, of course, there are always exceptions. People hallucinate or have dreams, just normal isolated dreams, which we then dismiss and say, okay, well, uh, you know, I, I saw the scary clown on the airplane, but that was just a dream because I wake up sweating in bed and ah, uh, right? Um, and so, of course, we have ways of dismissing certain elements of our experience as not being real, right? We, we, it doesn't, and the easiest way to find that is that it just doesn't fit in with other elements of our, our experience, right? Uh, if you go to sleep in bed, you have a bizarre kind of experience that makes no sense, and then you wake up in bed, it's very easy to look back on that experience and say, okay, that must have just been a weird dream. Right? Uh, what both The Matrix and Inception do is problematize our everyday experience for us. And I was talking about this, that philosophers typically don't engage in arguments about issues that aren't controversial at all, right? things that are just sort of obvious, everybody basically agrees on, unless they find some kind of way to make those issues more controversial or problematic. That's precisely what these films do for us. And as we're gonna see when we take a look at the readings, uh, the, the ideas behind the films and, and really motivating them that problematize our experience aren't particularly new. Frankly, the ancient Greeks had them well over 2,000 years ago. Uh, we're going to see in a reading from Rene, Rene Descartes on t tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, in the, from the 17th century. He has a, a very similar sort of idea that we can see motivating what's going on in both of these films. So let's just go around and get to what's going on in each of the films themselves uh, that, that really speak to this issue or bring this issue up. So I'm assuming by now you've watched the films. If you haven't, spoiler alert, I'm going to be talking about um, big reveals that happen and potentially the endings and so on. So don't watch the rest of the video if you haven't watched the film and you hate spoilers. If you don't care about spoilers or you've already seen the films, consider yourself safe. Okay, so The Matrix. Well, I better sort of make myself a little bit smaller here. I'm not, uh, um, well, whatever, I'm just gonna go over there. So The Matrix. What's the topic here? Really, um, you know, how do we know we're not in a computer simulation? And we can look at the matrix and look at what's going on there. And of course, just on a basic level, we can view it as a film and, and see what's going on. And then there's the question of, uh, you know, how, how does Neo know at any given point that he is or isn't in a computer simulation? Thinking about the essay question that I posed, it's, it's a little bit more uh, nuanced than that. And in the question, I, I pose it in a way that, you know, at any particular time in the film. So you've got to pay attention to when you're talking about it because Neo's, the philosophical way to talk about this, his epistemic state changes, right? Uh, epistemic is really an adjective meaning of or related to knowledge. So somebody's epistemic state is really their knowledge state. Right? And epistemology is really the study or theory of knowledge. So as the film progresses, Neo learns new things. Right? comes to know things that he didn't know before, which of course, as he's learning new pieces of information, uh, that changes his beliefs from what they were to something new. And so there's always this question as the film is progressing, how can, how can Neo know that the world is the way it appears to him at any given time? So of course he starts sort of fully in the matrix. And then as it goes on, right, he encounters Trinity and then Morpheus, he winds up coming out of the matrix and then going back into it and coming back out of it. Uh, and there, there are two more matrix films after this one. So if you've never watched all of them, there is a trilogy. Uh, in fact, they're working on a fourth one, I believe right now. Uh, and, and one low comment. So I've, I don't even know how many times I've watched the matrix by now. Uh, I, I, I have somewhat fond memories of being in high school and sitting around with one of my good friends watching this movie sort of ad nauseum, just sort of, over and over and you know, oh, what do you want to do today? Well, let's just watch The Matrix again. Yeah, okay. Uh, so th it's really retreading familiar ground, especially when I look back and think, oh, wow, that was, you know, 20, 20 ish years ago that I was doing that. Um, now here I am, I get to teach it. So you, you never know what things you wasted your time on at earlier parts in your life might come in handy later. So never, never let anybody tell you you're wasting your time. You can always turn around and say, you know what? I had a, a professor one time who wasted his time watching a movie over and over, and, and turns out that was just course prep for him. He just didn't know it at the time. 
Okay, so just a few interesting uh, scenes, situations, remarks, topics that come up in the matrix. Again, don't take this list to be exhaustive. Uh, so if, if there's something I don't talk about, you're like, oh, I think this is like really interesting. By all means, feel free to talk about it in your papers and, and forum posts and so on. There is no requirement that you absolutely have to talk about the things I'm gonna talk about. And one thing I really wanna emphasize, both in the forum posts and when you're writing your essays, they do not have to be comprehensive. So do not try to summarize the whole film. That's really not the point um, when you're talking about it. Try to narrow in and isolate on one or more things that are going on. So pick a scene or, or a set of scenes and really talk about those and why they're important and analyze them. Break them down, what's going on in terms of dialogue, in terms of action, in terms of how people look, right, the, the delivery. Uh, and this is where you look to Aaron Taylor's piece, Dr. Aaron Taylor's piece that I, I posted on Moodle as well. It's a little seven minute video where he's really just talking about how an, an actress's or actor's performance in delivering lines and, and doing certain things, as, as well as other matters itself really adds to the content of the film and when we're thinking about the philosophy of it or the, the philosophical assertions a film is making we really also have to think about how uh, you know not just the dialogue right it's not just um a piece of, of literature in that sense but there's more going on to it right there's there's action there's expression there's body language there's the overall context of things we can think about um, camera angles and so on now, this isn't a film studies course, so don't, don't get too carried away with, with that sort of thing. But insofar as you can talk about those sorts of issues and how they relate to the, the philosophical matters, ultimately the arguments, the sorts of reasons that we get to believe one thing rather than another, by all means, that's, that's fair game to include. Okay, so what, uh, what do we have going on? Of course, we've got the start of the movie, um, and, and you know, even before this first scene that I'm, I'm talking about, Neo is, is contacted by Trinity and winds up you know, following the White Rabbit, and meeting Trinity, um, getting to know little things about the Matrix, talks to Morpheus on the phone and everything. But after he gets uh, uh, taken by the agents, right, he gets, he gets bugged. That sort of weird, creepy scene where the bug gets inserted. Now, Neo wakes up in bed the next day. And you'll note that this happens a few times, right? He goes out to party and he wakes up in bed the next day. He gets bugged and he wakes up the next day. He wakes up the next day and he thinks it's just a dream. He dismisses it. Right, he, um, right. Uh, dismisses that as some sort of unfortunate nightmare. Later, after um, he, he's in the back of the car and Trinity removes it, of course, Neo exclaims, you know, that thing's real. So it's a perfect example of how what we're thinking about what's real and what isn't. And then we have some kind of sensory experience or a memory. I and mean, of course, there are interesting questions about how well our memories record or present to us what we actually experience versus adding new bits of content. The line between imagination and memory is sometimes a bit of a thin one. Our memories are really reconstructions of events in a certain way. So there's a whole area in psychology we could get into here, you know, the psychology of memory, which is very relevant, very interesting for a lot of what's going on in this course. But, I, you know, unfortunately, I just can't take 40 hours a week from you uh, and, and sort of, I don't know, chain you to the desk or the couch or something and, and make you read tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of things. Um, you know, we, we can only do so much in the course. So the psychology of memory, very interesting. I'm probably gonna make some remarks here and there about it, but nothing too specific uh, in, in part because it's, that's, that's not what we're doing here. But um, Neo dismisses having the bug implanted because it just seems too weird, right? It just doesn't seem to fit in with the rest of his experience, and perhaps he was drugged and so on, you know, the agents might have done something to try to wipe his, his memory. But of course, it's not entirely wiped, because then when it's taken out by Trinity, um, obviously Neil remembers it going in, and that he's dismissed it, because now he's, he's emails, right, that thing's real, right, why? Later, when Morpheus is, is talking to Neil, he says to him, you have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he's ex expecting to wake up. I find that to be an interesting line. I've stuck it in here in part because I find it a little difficult to figure out exactly what to make of it. Uh, really, what, what that seems to mean is that Neo is accepting his experience, what he's seeing, precisely because he already knows on some level that he's in a dream. And because he knows he's in a dream, or really, in this instance, the computer simulation, but here we're mixing the, the uh, 
the ways that we can approach the topic, right? Computer simulation versus dreams. Neo is accepting his situation, so accepting what's going on within it. Now, in talking to Morpheus about fate, so this is when they're sort of encounter each other, uh, they're talking about the you know, blue pill, red pills, very famous scene. Um, they're talking about fate, and, and Neo says that he doesn't like the idea of fate, right? He doesn't believe in fate. And Morpheus asks why, and Neo responds, because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. And, and this is very interesting. So Neo holds a particular belief, right? Namely that fate isn't real. Why? Because of a particular kind of, of feeling he has, right? He doesn't like a particular sort of idea, so he doesn't believe in it, right? If fate were real, then Neo wouldn't be fully in control of his life. Neo doesn't like the idea. He doesn't, it makes him feel bad to think he's not in control of his life, so he rejects the view that fate exists. Of course, there's the oracle. Um, there are interesting questions there about to, to what extent does fate really exist and is Neo acting at his fate and you know, things are foretold. So there's a whole question of, of determinism and, and fate running through this film as well, but we're not going to touch on that. Um, just limited time. That's a, yet another philosophical topic we could talk about in the film, but we're just not going to. But it's, it's interesting. Neo holds a certain kind of belief because holding a different belief or an alternative belief would make him feel bad. And that's enough for him to hold one certain belief as long as the evidence uh, against that belief isn't really overwhelming. And so this is an interesting thing to think about, especially when we're thinking about this topic more generally. You know, is, is the world the way it seems to us? Instinctively, you, I can almost guarantee, as well as most people, including me, want to say yes, of course it is, right? Why? If you really think about it, like, and, and I don't mean just, just think about it, but seriously entertain the possibility that the world isn't the way it appears to us. That's likely to make you feel awfully strange and likely to make you feel not very good. That's concerning, right? What if most, if not all, the things you knew about the world around us were wrong? It's very disorienting. And in fact, when Neo comes to learn these things, he, he pops, right? He throws up and he, he, he just can't handle it. It's just too overwhelming for him. Just like I believe it would be overwhelming for us to find out that the world we live in is not the way it appears. You know, what if we really were in the matrix? And of course, it's easy to chuck and say, oh, well, yeah, but we're not. How do you know? That's exactly the question. How can we be sure? And, and there are separate questions about the nature of knowledge, and there's some interesting play in this film between, uh, um, both in this film and the other film, playing around with, with notions of knowledge versus belief, right? Normally when we say, I know something rather than merely believe something, what we mean is that we believe something and our belief is correct, it's, it's true, and that our belief is justified. We've got reasons or evidence that support it. But even though we might have good evidence to support our belief, the world's the way it seems to us, it might, despite the evidence, actually be a false belief. That's something we're gonna see when we take a look at the readings and, and get into a little bit more. So we've got that second point there, what else do we have? Uh, Morpheus, in, in talking to Neo, this is after Neo has uh, um, come out of the matrix and they're back in the, the loading program, uh, you know, that sort of white space with the, the few random things. They're having a very interesting discussion there. The whole scene is very interesting, very fruitful, so I'll just direct your attention to that. Um, there's, in particular, this line, though, that Morpheus gives, and by the way, I haven't put in timestamps here. A reminder, if you are quoting the films or even talking about particular scenes, much like you cite the particular page of a written document, give me timestamps. So tell me uh, approximately where it happens. So I haven't told you the, the timestamp here, but if you were to quote this in an essay, don't quote the slides here. Instead, this is coming from the film, right? These slides are really just making use of the film. Uh, tell me where this happens. It doesn't have to be exact, you know, it doesn't have to be right to the second, but it should be fairly close. It should be within a, a minute or, or maybe you know, a couple of minutes. Or if there's a, an extended scene and you want to talk about the scene in a more general way, uh, bookend, right? It started at 32 minutes and it was over at 35 minutes and 30 seconds or whatever. So this comment from Morpheus to Neo, have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? 
What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? And this is exactly what I was talking about. We form our belief on the basis of the evidence at our disposal. Generally speaking, our sensory experience fits together in a fairly coherent fashion, right? I, I go to sleep and I wake up in the same room and it's adjusted the same way. When I leave my office and come back in, things are in the places I left them, as best I can remember, right? um, And so on and so on, right? Our, our world seems fairly consistent. It, it seems fairly coherent, our, our experience of it. It fits together in the right kind of way. It's not constantly changing. but we could be in something like a computer simulation that is designed to be consistent and coherent in that way. In that case, if all of our experience were within the simulation, then of course our experience would be coherent and, and consistent, which would suggest that perhaps we're not in the simulation, even though we were. So there's that, that question, how would we know whether or not we're in the simulation? Neo gets contacted by Trinity and Morpheus. Neo has some of that experiences. He sees some things that don't really make sense, like the bug instance. Right? But what about the rest of the people stuck in the matrix that don't have that? Right? There's also the issue of deja vu that comes up later in the film. I have deja vu from time to time. I'm sure you do too. What does that tell us? Oh, its own doesn't seem like anything, really. But we're told that one way to interpret that, what's going on at least within the, the world of the Matrix, is that means that there was some kind of change in the Matrix. Right? There's some kind of glitch. Something is not quite so coherent. But of course, when that sort of thing happens to us, we tend to dismiss it. Now, uh, Neo's faced with a choice. Morpheus offers him the, the two pills, right? Take the blue pill, you stay in the Matrix. You can wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. That's the almost an exact quote if it's not. Just remember to know off the top of my head. Uh, just like already in the film, Neo has woken up in his bed, right? After being out partying and seeing Trinity, after being abducted by the agents and having the bug implanted, wakes up and then believes, well, whatever, you know, you wake up the next morning and um, right? sometimes we might even have a memory of something we choose to ignore it or we say, oh, that, was, that must be wrong or mistaken or, or some kind of fantasy. But Neo, of course, takes the red pill. Um, and then the wakes up and then Morpheus welcomes him to the real world. Uh, also, I, I think a correction here. I said on point three, that quotation came from the loading program, uh, just given where I have it here in the sequence. I think it must come from that discussion that he and uh, that Morpheus and me were having um, before Morpheus offers the pills. But I'm, you know, this is something I'll, I have to go back and refer to my notes to. So one other tip, take good notes. So you've got a, a good sense of exactly what's going on. In the film. So I do have notes and when I'm you know, reading papers and, and posts and things like that. I'll be going back through my notes, refreshing myself. And when I see things that are unfamiliar, that's exactly when the timestamps come in handy because you might say something. I might go, really? Was that really in the film? Of course, I'm not going to rewatch the entire film to find a 30 second uh, clip or quotation or something. That's why the timestamps are handy because I'm, I'm willing to trust you to some degree, but of course, I'm a little bit skeptical too. You say something was in the film and I don't clearly remember it. I'm going to flip to that spot and take a look at what you're talking about. All right. Um, last point here. When, now, now this definitely is in that loading program, that white screen area. Uh, when they first go in, Neo's a little bit skeptical, or perhaps not even quite skeptical, right? He's uh, sort of disoriented that they're in a computer program, right? He, he sort of asks him, like, wait, we're in a computer program? And, and Morpheus justifies the belief, right? He says, look, you know, you're, you're different, your hair's different, you've got different clothes, you don't have the, the plugs and stuff in your body anymore. Um, is it really that hard to believe? What? And, and then, you know, Neo says, what, this isn't real? Like, we're, we're not in a real place, this isn't a real chair I'm touching. And then Morpheus responds, right? You know, what is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Now this ties into our second topic as well, value and reality, where there's a question of, does something have to be real to be valuable? Right? Um, and so we're gonna get into that next week. And this is where particularly Cypher uh, is a very interesting character in the Matrix about this. Uh, and in Inception, this comes up as well. But these questions about, um, you know, does it matter if we're in a computer simulation or in a dream or something like that? Does something like a person or an experience or a thing have to be real in some sense to be valuable? 
And there are these interesting questions about what it is to be real. Now, of course, implicit what Neo is saying here is that um, something that is part of our experience, but isn't a physical object, that is our experience isn't showing us, uh, uh, or it doesn't correspond to a physical object that is at least roughly the way we experience and hence think it to be. Uh, that sort of experience then isn't real. It's not, to use a more technical term, veridical, that is accurately representing reality. So um, this is where we start getting into some other interesting territory, right? So now Neo's sort of woken up and he goes in the matrix and he goes back out of the matrix and you know some various things happen throughout the rest of the film, but this is really the big, the, for, for this topic, these are largely our, our big scenes, our big um, plot points. Um, at the start of the film, Neo, so far as he can tell, the world is the way it seems to him. Even though Morpheus tells us later, you know, Neo, Neo's always felt something's not quite right. You know, it doesn't feel like things are, are quite the way they seem or something like that. But Neo doesn't really know what to make of it. Until he's given evidence, until he's told by you know, Morpheus, Trinity, and so on, that the world is the way it seems to him. Now, of course, one other point I want to make here is, that just especially on point five, once Neo is put back into the loading program, and he is shown that you can be put into a program that minds can be, or, or you know, our brains can be manipulated to make us experience things in a certain kind of way. There's a question that the film, I think, doesn't delve into very deeply. It doesn't uh, really make it problematic, but I want to do that for you, which is this question of how can Neo be certain that Morpheus and Trinity and the rest of them are really being sincere? Or in fact, how can he be certain they're real? How does he know he's not on a computer simulation once he's been taken out of the simulation and he's on the Nebuchadnezzar, he's on the ship, right? He's going in and out of the matrix and so on. How does he know what is purported to be reality at that point? How does he know that's really real? How does he know that Morpheus and Trinity and the rest of them aren't just part of some other computer program? How does he know that, say, Morpheus isn't manipulating him uh, or, or perhaps all of them? Uh, that, in fact, the real world was the one he was initially in and now he's in a simulation when he, he wakes up, right? And he's just going through different parts of the simulation when he then enters other simulations, i.e. goes back in the matrix. So I'll leave that with you to think about. So now let's flip over to Inception. Uh, more recent film, so this came out you know, 11, 11 years after um, the matrix. Uh, a bit of a different take, but very much the same issue, set of issues I think coming up in the film. There's some other ones as well, but um, we'll, we'll stick with this, uh, you know, the, the two topics we've got in it. So the topic here, how do we know, oh, okay, no, I'm just totally cutting, cutting that up. You know, how do we know, uh, I'll try to get myself out of the way, uh, we are or are not dreaming. Right? So instead of being in a computer simulation, now it's dreams, but it's the same underlying issue. Uh, we've got sensory experience that, you know, shows us a world around us. It seems pretty consistent most of the time. But it can be consistent, right? It can all fit together in the right kind of way. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the world is the way it appears to us. And of course, Mal is a very interesting character here. So uh, Cobb, Cobb's wife, um, deceased wife. One other thing, I'm generally going to be talking about characters in the films. I expect you to do the same. If you want you know, a breakdown of the characters and so on, look at the credits, that's one good place to go. Uh, IMDB, the, the website as well, that's a good place to go just as a resource for seeing, you know, what actor or actress was playing what character, and you can sort of see a picture of them to, to try to make those sorts of connections if you aren't sure what the names of the people were and so on. So Cobb, Leonardo DiCaprio, right, his wife, um, Mal, who's deceased, she isn't, um, uh, um, right, she comes to feel that her reality isn't, isn't real. That the things she's seeing around her, the experiences she have, she's having, don't accurately reflect what the world really is. And so she comes to believe that death is the only escape. Why? Precisely because um, the, you know, they've developed this technology somehow to, to artificially enter dreams and manipulate them. Um, and the only way to get out of those dreams, other than having your time sort of run up, based on, on the sedative or for whatever the biological mechanism is that, that puts you to sleep and makes you dream, uh, you have to die in the dream. That's how you wake up, right? 
anything short of dying in the dream, you just sort of feel whatever's going on. So you feel the pain or the pleasure or whatever it is. You, you've got the full sensory experience. Things seem real until you die and you wake up and you realize that it was a dream. Um, now, so Mal is this interesting character because, of course, she and Cobb were in, in limbo for, you know, the sort of deep, deep dream states or pure subconscious for years. Really, we've come to find out a lifetime, something like 50 years together. Uh, and, and she, and, and as we know, Cobb, Inception is really planting some kind of idea in somebody else's mind. And of, there's also extraction taking something out of somebody's mind. So Cobb plants this idea in Mal's mind that, that her reality isn't the way it appears to, or reality isn't the way it appears to her, right? That, that her reality isn't real, that she's dreaming somehow. And then of course, the way that the story's told and, uh, you know, on a surface level, if, so if you've only watched the movie once, I'm hoping I want to say a few things that make you go, oh, what? No. And then go watch the movie all over again and experience it on a totally different level and, and just, you know, go like, this is way deeper and more interesting than I thought. Because that's certainly the experience I had, um, you know, with both of these films. And, and I've tried to pick films in this course that I think really do have some layers that you can delve through and, and you know, sort of get deeper and, and really give us some content to think about. So we've got Mal, and then of course, the way the film is shot generally, uh, it seems like we, you know, a lot of the film, is going on in the dreamscape, but there's also reality, right? We've got, especially, you know, at the start of the film, we've got some dream stuff going on, and we're out in reality. Cobb takes the job and, and everything. Um, and then, you know, the, the team goes in, and he finds Mal down in there, and then at the end of the film, they're back out of the dream, and everything's successful, and he finally gets to go home and everything. Um, and so Mal is this character who was, you know, in the dream, and then came to feel that it was a dream, that a reality wasn't real, and then wakes up. But even after she wakes up, she continues to have that feeling. She continues to have that idea that her reality isn't real, that, that she's still in a dream. So she needs to die to really wake up and go back to her children. And there are some interesting scenes with her and Cobb talking about this. Now, early in the film, after Ariadne is first introduced, her and Cobb talk about being in dreams. Uh, and, and, you know, they're sitting in a cafe. And in fact, Ariadne doesn't realize they're in a dream as they're having the discussion results in some interesting things. But then, uh, you know, what, what Cobb notes is that we don't really realize we're in a dream until after the fact, right? It's not until we realize something's wrong or, or sort of fishy. And if, you know, you yourself, so there's some interesting questions here about dreams you've had. And this, right, your own experience with dreams is something you can also talk about in the essays. Remember, it's a kind of anecdotal evidence. You're talking about the experience of at least what one person has had with dreams. So don't, don't be too quick to universalize or generalize to everybody. You can certainly talk about some people. I don't dream that much, but, you know, sometimes when I do, uh, you know, I've, I've had a few different experiences. One, being in a dream and realizing it's a dream. Right? Two, being in a dream and not realizing it's a dream until you wake up. Three, I've had rarely, but on occasion, a dream within a dream, right? So I have a dream and then I wake up, but I wake up to a different level of dreaming. And then it's only after I wake up from that that I realize that, you know, I was two layers down. Uh, I don't think I've ever gone three, so... I don't think, but who knows what I remember. But it's this point, you know, we, when we're in the dream, we don't necessarily realize that we're in the dream, right? It seems real enough until something goes wrong or, or something's odd or, or we get some kind of awareness, right? We, we get this feeling that it's not real. Precisely the feeling that makes Mal skeptical that the world is the way it appears to her even after she's woken up, right? Because she thinks she's still at least one layer down. She's not really out of there yet. Right? She still has that feeling. And if death is the only way to get that next layer up, how can she ever be sure without effectively killing herself and finally not waking up, at which point, presumably, she's not going to know? Um, how can she really know that she's finally out of the dream, that she's finally, you know, not at least one layer down? Oh, that's something we're going to come to when we talk about totos here. But so Cobb is talking with Ariadne, and he, he remarks, he says, you never really remember the beginning of the dream, do you? You always wind up right in the middle of what's going on. Right? And, and he asks her, how did we get here? How did we get to this cafe? And that's when she realizes, you know, she can't remember. And that's when she realizes she's in a dream. Uh, just, just a note here. You know, think, think about that, that comment. How's the film start? How do, how, do we, how do we get somewhere in the film? Don't we sort of start right in the middle of the action? 
there's already an extraction going on. They're, they're trying out for the job they're going to take. We start right in the middle of something. And then the film goes on from there. Are we sure that what seems to be the reality in the film, being outside of dreams entirely, do we know that that is sort of a God's eye view of things? That that is in fact reality? That that's an accurate report of the physical world around Cobb? Or are we following Cobb's point of view through the film? Is that what we're doing? If so, how do we know, um, oh, and then I'm, I'm covering this up in the corner. Um, how does Cobb know he's not in a dream or not? Well, this is where totems come in. And I'm, I'm sorry if I'm covering up on the top corner of the screen there. I'm not quite sure how to totally get myself uh, out of that position. So totems, these are personal items that only the individual who has them is supposed to know about. But as we're told, right, because if, and this is where Arthur uh, and Ariadne talk about this a little bit, the totem has to be something only you really know about, you know, how it feels, how it works, right? It could be a loaded die or you know, a chess piece or something, or that spinning top that Cobb uses. But it has to have certain sorts of properties that only you know about, precisely so that if you're in a dream, because if you're in somebody else's dream, right, um, if you're in somebody else's dream, then you're going to not have the totem work the right way because that's just not going to be something anybody else knows about. So you could only perhaps be stuck in your own dream where you know how the totem works, but the totem's only supposed to you know work correctly in reality. And so uh, you know Ariadne sort of wants to know about Arthur's totem, but he says you know no you can't you can't do that because you know as soon as you know about it, it defeats the purpose right because if you know how my totem works, then I'll never know if I'm stuck in your dream. Right. And Ariadne, after she makes her own totem, Cobb sort of asks, oh, can I see it? She says, no. And I says, okay, good, you're learning. But Cobb's totem was originally Mal's. That's precisely what he set spinning to plant the idea in Mal's mind that she was stuck in a dream. So how does Cobb know he isn't dreaming? He's taken Mal's totem, what somebody else used. Of course, you say, well, Mal's dead. Is she? Mal's dead so far as Cobb is concerned. But if he's stuck in a dream, he might be stuck in a dream in which Mal is dead. So these totems are supposed to be the thing that, that tell us whether or not we're in a dream, give us some kind of guarantee, but how reliable can they be really? And in Cobb's case, his totem wasn't originally his. So how can, how can we be sure how, that Cobb isn't dreaming? How can he be sure that he isn't dreaming? Right? And in fact, as we learn through Ariadne's interactions with him, Cobb revisits his memories every night, right? Every night he dreams for you know, hours within the memories. So he has a whole second life going on within his memories. Uh, and we find out that he's incredibly motivated to return to his real children, right? Not the children in the dream, what he takes to be the dream, where Mal invites him to stay and so on. But Cobb is absolutely motivated to get back to what he believes are his real children, right? So Cobb is actually splitting his time, perhaps not equally, but splitting his time between these, these dreams that are really memories and so are, are very familiar and as he himself says, are likely to confuse somebody about what's real and what isn't. Um, so he's doing that. He has this totem that he uses to try to make sure when he's actually out of the dream or, or not, but it wasn't originally his totem, right? So could he be stuck in Mal's dream? Could he be stuck in his own dream? And of course, Mal, the you know, dream Mal, real Mal, who knows, it, it does seem based on, on some of the cutting and dialogue and, and some of the action that probably Mal is just a dream, right? um, based on, on some of what they say later in the film, near the end of the film. But, uh, but right, don't, don't let what I just said sort of skew you. If you don't think that's right, make the argument. I'm, right, and I, I don't think definitively that's what's going on. I'm just saying there, there's good evidence to believe that way. But there's also some good evidence to believe that really Cobb is in a dream and, and perhaps this is the real Mal or a dream Mal, but the real Mal is still out there. Right? So Mal, whatever status she has, offers a different view, right? Their children are with her. It's not on some other layer, right? There's not, not some reality where Cobb has to wake up to get back to the real children. The children are there. And of course, there's the ending, right? We get this cliffhanger ending absolutely designed to be this kind of 
um, you know, a cliffhanger, uncertain, ambiguous kind of ending where, where the top's going and it goes way too long, right? And then it finally starts to sort of wobble and then we cut, right? Or credits. So, you know, was it a dream or not? Well, you don't know. And it's only right at the end that we finally get to see those children, right? The whole rest of the time through the film, we never see the children's faces, right? And they're always sort of running away and there's the same thing going on. And it's only at the end of the film, Cobb finally gets to see them. And they haven't aged, and it seems like time has passed since Cobb last saw them. But maybe not. It's not exactly clear how long he's been running around, or at least I don't, I don't believe it's made exactly clear. Uh, and Mal does note as well, right, this, this dream Mal or whatever, that Cobb's own experience has a lot of the characteristics of being stuck in a dream, being persecuted, chased around the world by anonymous corporations and governments and police agencies and all these sorts of things, being chased just like the, the you know, subconscious will chase around a dreamer. So there are these interesting similarities. And she even remarks that Cobb doesn't really believe in one reality anymore and invites him to stay there. So we are given some, some really interesting pieces of evidence to reduce our certainty about what it is we're seeing in the film. Are we seeing things the way they really are? Are we seeing Cobb's version of things? Is Cobb stuck in the dream, right? Is Mal real? Is Mal just fictitious? What about any of the other characters? If we're in Cobb's dream, there's no guarantee any of the other characters we encounter in the film are Right? And earlier in the film, uh, so much earlier, this is you know, something like 20-ish minutes in or something, Cobb talks with Miles. Uh, Miles is his is, is father-in-law, right? Um, Michael Caine. Uh, and, and they're having this discussion back and forth. And that, I find that discussion very interesting as well. I think that one's worth a rewatch. They have this discussion back and forth, and, and Cobb wants you know, one of Miles' students so he can train them to uh, build dreamscapes, you know, the, these levels so that they go do this job, and that's what's gonna get Cobb home to find his real children, right? Your grandchildren and everything. And then Miles remarks, and you've gotta sort of watch the way Michael Caine delivers it as well. You know, as, as well, you know, throughout the film, all sorts of different things like this. But just how he looks, right? He looks sort of disappointed and, and sad, um, I, I think sort of disturbed by what Cobb's saying, right? You know. I gotta get back to my children, you know, my real children, your grandchildren, they need to see their father, et cetera, et cetera. And there's Miles sort of, you know, listening to what Cobb's saying. And then he says to him, come back to reality, Dom, please, right? What does he mean, right? And then he even says, what, you wanna take one of my students and sort of wrap them up in your fantasy world? What's he saying there? Is he, is he telling us, is this a moment of clarity where Cobb's actually encountering Miles? Or, or some version of Miles that's telling him you're stuck in a dream, come back to reality, wake up, you're still stuck down in there. And of course we have reason to believe maybe Cobb is because he spent so much time down there with Mal, right? He spent a lifetime, 50 years down in limbo. So if he's come up a level or a couple of levels, how are we sure he's come up enough? Or is that real reality? Is that physical reality? Is that not in a dream at all? And what Miles is talking about and coming back to reality is, is you know, trying to quit all this running around, doing this criminal sort of inception extraction stuff um, and, and coming back to reality in some other more metaphorical sense. Not, not certain. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up there. Like I said, I could, I could probably spend hours and hours and hours <laughs> talking about little minute details of the films and what's going on and, and how those things might interact in different ways to interpret them. But I hope just going through these, has drawn your attention to some, some of the highlights, explain what our topic in general is, right? How, how can we be certain the world is the way it appears to us? How do we know we're not in a dream? Like, right, uh, how, how do the characters in Inception, such as Cobb or Mal, know that they are or are not in a dream at any given point? How do we know we're not in a computer simulation? How does Neo know that he was in a simulation or that he isn't anymore? or that he has not now been plugged into a simulation after Morpheus wakes him up and takes him out of it, right? Um, particular, and, and I already mentioned this, and I won't get into too, you know, more detail, but when we talk about memory as well, right, and this comes up in Inception, we never really remember how we get into somewhere in the dream, you know, our, our memories are imperfect and limited. Uh, in The Matrix as well, you know, Neo wakes up in bed, right? What, is, what does he really remember versus what did he imagine? What did he dream? What has the matrix sort of programmed into him? Cypher talks about this as well. Cypher wants to get plugged back in the matrix and then he's gonna have his memory wiped, right? That's what he wants. I don't wanna remember being in the real world anymore. I want you to just, you know, reset. So obviously 
that's some kind of capability that the machines have within the matrix world. So how accurate are our memories really? Can we really trust our sense experience? How can you be certain the world is really the way it seems to be around you right now? That's our first topic. That's what these two films have in common, at least on, on this layer. We're gonna take a look at three readings this week. Uh, Descartes' readings is really this, you know, the, sort of putting out the skeptical argument. How can we be sure we're not in a dream, right? Uh, and, and I wanna tell you right now, the Descartes reading just sort of ends on a cliffhanger. He goes on and, and you know, in the meditations, talks at length uh, about how to solve the problem, but really what we're just seeing is him setting up the problem, the, the reading we've got. Then we've got Nick Bostrom, who really makes the argument that, as he says, you know, it's actually likely that we're in a computer simulation, or there's a few other theses that he say, you know, it's, it's highly probable is one of these are true. And one of those is that we are, in fact, in a computer simulation, the world is the way it seems to us. Uh, and then lastly, we've got a piece from Alan Hazlatt that's a little bit more sort of technical and, and recent, and he outlines um, really a, a way of approaching within epistemology, so you know, within this theory of knowledge, a way of thinking about these issues and, and trying to formalize them in a certain kind of way, and, and it produces some pretty interesting distinctions, and I think the piece is, is pretty on point, and it's also uh, relatively short. It's a little complex, a little bit abstract, so in the lecture I'm certainly going to be talking about some of the terms he uses and, and just giving some background and, and explanation to try to make it a little bit more sensible, uh, but he's, he is pretty on, on point, so we're going to get some material here of the pieces that does clearly connect in certain ways to the, the material we've got in the films, and of course we can take the films and bring them into conversation with each other because they each provide their own take on what's going on. So we'll go ahead and stop there. I hope you're having a great Monday and I'll see you tomorrow when I'll be talking about Descartes. Until then, bye for now.